Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Lynn. I'm an alcoholic. This will only take a moment. I must get this spawn of Satan ready. What did we do without these, right? Incredible. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and be with you tonight. I am uh, here from Oklahoma, where y'all is singular and all y'all's plural. I, uh, when I got the call, I immediately started a diet. (laughs) Worst 17 minutes of my life. (laughs) But I joined a gym, and that seems to be working pretty well. Buffing up, you know, particularly in my butt. I've noticed here lately that it seems like every time I walk away from a group of people, I hear somebody say, what an ass. <laughs> the truth police are with us tonight. I know it's a long ways from Oklahoma. I thought I can really entertain these people. There's no need for the truth. Nobody knows me. However... My home group, um, which, by the way, if you're ever in Oklahoma City, we meet on Wednesday night. It's a men's group. At 745, we have announcements because we stay really active in the uh, recovery community. And uh, 8 o'clock meeting from 8 to 9, we're in the book. We go out in the community, in the AA community, in the recovery community um, during the week. And uh, lo and behold, one of our members... is now one of your members. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma and uh, came here to be a school teacher. We had a, everybody has a nickname in the, our group is called the Altered Boys. (laughs) Everybody has a nickname. I'm Benny B. Um, We had a big mic. So when this guy joined us, his name became Little Dave. <laughs> he is a part of the truth police because we do a lot of getting a car. And Little Davey was getting a car for a couple of years in Oklahoma City. So he's heard most of our stories so many times. If I stumble tonight in mid-sentence, he will stand and finish the sentence. Don't worry. You're in, you're in good hands. Also from Norman, Oklahoma, anonymously, is Mark over here. He's moved into your community conveniently, I don't know, several thousand miles from Norman, Oklahoma, his home, and has established his recovery here in the, uh, in the Seattle community. Uh, Otto from Arkansas said to tell you hi. I'm taking care of all of the house cleaning duties here. Otto has spoken, I think, 400 places. Uh, he was on the circuit for a long time. Um, Otto's real claim to fame is that he sobered up one day before I did. And he sends me a card every year telling me that. <laughs> this was his favorite place to speak. He said, I just love that place. Tell them all hi. So Otto says hi. Mark, what an incredible host. He has, I said, I really want to get a little quiet time this afternoon because, you know, we do this thing of what I was like, what happened, and what what I'm like today. I mean, it's our story. We should kind of know what was going on, except many of us were blackout drinkers and really don't know some of the stuff that was going on. But I said, I need a little quiet time. I just want to be able to think about it a little bit. But we got down there with the fish-throwing guys, And the afternoon just went away. What a fun, fun afternoon. 
thank you, Mark, and I, I, I know that I'm with the right guy doing the right stuff because the last thing he did before we left way late this afternoon was uh, go to the flower vendor and buy flowers for his mom, Marcy, who's here on the front row. Nice job, Mark. Well, I see as I look out, we have two types of felons here tonight, convicted and non-convicted. I'm in the right place. For those of you that aren't blackout drinkers, I'm sorry. Time travel is a heck of a way to go through life. You've never really lived until you've come out of a blackout, surrounded by policemen, in, and you're in mid-sentence. <laughs> and one of the cops invariably says, okay, bud, what's it going to be? Not a fair question. I have no idea. I just got here. <laughs> So if, you, um, if, if tonight is okay, we get to know each other a little bit in the thank you line, that'll be wonderful. If it's not okay, I still encourage you to get in the thank you line and say, Ben, I want to thank you for coming all the way from Oklahoma to help teach me, teach me patience and tolerance. I hung with you all night tonight. So what we do is tell you a little bit about how it started, it started in northwest Oklahoma on a farm or a ranch, whichever you think is the most glamorous. I had a conflicted childhood in that my mother was the ideal woman of the world, the greatest person that's ever lived on the face of the earth. She uh, taught school all of her life, was in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame of Teachers, uh, which was the single most important thing for her in the world, was teaching kids. And then my dad. My dad was the town drunk for about six or seven little towns in our part of the country. <laughs> my dad was uh, a tremendous athlete. Uh, he landed on Normandy Beach during World War II. If you know anything about that invasion, literally tens of thousands of, of Americans died. He had been playing professional baseball and there was a, a, a trend, if you will, to come serve your country in the buddy plan. So several of them that played ball together went to the military on the buddy plan. And he was pinned down on the beaches of Normandy behind the bodies of his buddies. And that affected him the rest of his life. He started drinking when he was 12 years old, white lightning on the... Uh, on the farm or the ranch, uh, no use going into town, we make our own. His, uh, his, his way of doing business was, if it moves, hit it. And that went for his kids too. Me and a little brother is five years younger than me. When I was 15, uh, I told my dad he couldn't spank me anymore. I was too big. He said, that's fine. And we started fist fighting which I never won. When we uh, buried my dad just a few years ago, um, we put a whole lot of athletic medals in his casket and five bronze stars. My son has been medically retired from the Army for just a couple of years. He was going to be a, a life server in the Army. He was in the 82nd Airborne. He got hurt in Iraq. He did two tours in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. He got hurt in Iraq. He got hurt really bad in Afghanistan. And after a year of surgeries, uh, a surgery every two months for a year, uh, and a year of emotional counseling, they decided he couldn't return to duty, and at 37 years old, he was medically retired. My son is treated for the same things that my dad had. They just didn't have a name when my dad had them. PTSD was called combat fatigue or soldier's heart. Uh, it was a time of 
big boys don't cry, grab your bootstraps, shut up. My dad sobered up when he was 60 years old, when he was finally incarcerated. Strangely enough, he showed up, or he sobered up, about six months after the al caught up with my mom. <laughs> it started to turn. My dad was known by everybody in that part of the country. And the general deal was the sheriff of whatever county would call my mom and say he's up here in jail and she'd go get him. Well, after the al got a hold of her, the sheriff of Woods County called one day and he said, Raymond told me to tell you that he's up here in jail. Got him up here in jail. She said, my mom said, okay, tell him you told me. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of when his world started to change. Um, he was incarcerated when he was 60. Um, my little brother had stayed with my dad when I left. I forgot to tell you that he beat me up pretty bad one time, and I ran away from home. And I went to Dallas. I was 15 years old, and I ended up running the streets of downtown Dallas, which today I probably wouldn't recommend. It didn't seem like a bad idea at the time. And I ran into two guys that were a little bit older than me who had been kicked out of, uh, of uh, military school. They were from broken families when that was unusual. They were in the custody of their fathers, which was very unusual. And their fathers had said, we don't care what you do, but you can't stay here. So we were just entering the Vietnam era, and Texas Instruments was uh, uh, putting electronics and radars in those Huey helicopters, sending them to Vietnam, and they were getting shot down like ducks. The minimum wage, I think, then was like a dollar and a quarter an hour. And Texas Instrument was paying $31 an hour to install electronics in these helicopters. So they were really sought after jobs. But you had to have an electronics license, licensed by the government, a third certificate, a second, and a first. And you had to have at least a first. So to pass that test was difficult, so schools were popping up to to really coach you up to be able to pass the test so you could go to work at, at Texas Instrument. And to make them more glamorous, they combined them with broadcasting. You want to be a hot jock? Come to... So these guys were in Dallas to go to Elkins Institute of Broadcasting and Electronics. I'm just there. One of their dads flies down. He's very rich. We sat down at at the at Love Field, there was no DFW then, and he said, so you guys want to go to broadcasting school? They said, yeah. He said, what about, he'd never met me in his life. He said, what about you? You want to go? I went, yeah. So I went to broadcasting school and electronics school, and I got the certificate. Every radio station in the United States until the Clinton years when it was repealed had to have this first class certificate on the wall in the radio station. Most of the times, the certificate belonged to an electronics engineer who kind of knew what he was doing. Then there was me with mine. But they had a placement bureau and there was a, there was a, a radio station that needed a first class certificate and so they hired me. I had since turned 16, and they put me doing what I was qualified to do. I was mowing the lawn, <laughs> and really doing a pretty fair job of mowing the lawn. Well, the radio station was owned by a guy who was like a million years old. I was 16, he was probably 38. And we were in a college town, and he had a trophy wife. He had married a college girl. She was 21 years old. He went out of town on a fishing weekend. The program director and she had a tryst, and they got caught. They fired the program director and said, okay, who are we going to put on the air? And there was nobody around except the kids standing by the lawnmower. And the famous Bendel 10 show was born. I know a lot of people do things because they are qualified. I just happen to be standing by a lawnmower. <laughs> but it really turned out pretty well. Advertising, um, radio, TV, 
really fits people like me really well. Lots of alcohol, lots of drugs, short shift. About anybody can get through a four-hour day if they really concentrate. <laughs> and I did well. I mean, I really did. I was the, shortly, at about age 20, I was the vice president of a broadcasting company in Oklahoma City that was a family-owned company. I was married, had built a new house, had an airplane, had bought a big boat, moved it to Lake Eufaula outside of Oklahoma City. My little brother, five years younger than me, was in the Strategic Air Command. All of us have been in the military. I did my military time. I will tell you about my glamorous military career in, in one short little deal here. I was standing in uh, Reveille before dawn, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 101st Airborne, Drill Sergeant Donnelly, all six, four of him, was over the top of me, and he was looking down at me, and he said, Buckland, we could hang every piece of equipment on you the Army has ever made or ever used, and you'd still look like a civilian. I took it to be a compliment, but the Army really wasn't my bag. My little brother was flying with the Strategic Air Command out of Offutt Air Force Base. He was married and he had two kids. One of them he'd seen born. The second one he was deployed. They came pretty close together. His anniversary was on August the 16th. He was going to get a month's leave, come back to the farm or the ranch, see my parents. I was married, had two children at the time, and I took my group up to the farm and we had his reunion on August 16th. I wanted him to see all of my cool stuff. So I conned and manipulated and did those things that we do. We left the farm on the 17th, the girls in the van with the, with the babies. My little brother and I in the car, we started drinking at 9 o'clock in the morning. We drove to Oklahoma City. It's a four-hour drive. I showed him the radio stations, the airplane, all of that stuff, the new house. We went down to the lake another three hours took the big boat out, it, was, it slept 12, had a galley, it was, it, was, it was a big boat. And we drank all of that day. We pulled the big boat back in the dock at 10 o'clock that night and, and I had this thing that I, that I now know is an amends, I didn't know what an amends was, but I was going to tell my little brother how much I appreciated, because when I left the farm, I pretty much left. My little brother stayed there during the time that my dad was absolutely pillaging the countryside. My little brother got him out of so many scrapes, and they were best friends. And I wanted to make that amends to him. We were up on the front of the boat. We'd stop going downstairs to go to the bathroom because the girls were really not happy with us. It's now 10 at night. We've drank since 9 that morning. So I say, Kelly, there's something I want to say to you. And he said, if it's one of your sermons, hang on a minute. I got to go to the bathroom. Well, we'd, we'd stop going downstairs because our wives were so mad. We'd just jump off the front of the boat onto the dock and then take the ladder back up. So he walked to the edge and jumped off. And the, we were parked where the big boats park, where they're really deep. And it, the, the boat had slipped away a little bit in the darkness and he clipped his chin on the uh, dock and he slipped into the water and he drowned. And he drowned right where we were, right where we were looking for him. There are two things that I, that I want to say to you about that. One is, my dad at that time was one year sober. He was 60 years old. He drank alcoholically since he was in high school. Started drinking when he was 12 years old. There's one meeting a week in that part of Oklahoma, 7 o'clock Wednesday evening. The Al-Anon's meet, it's, an old, it was an old, it's been destroyed now. It was an old condemned house like a plantation-looking thing. al met in one room. AA's met in another. If you missed that meeting, you just missed it. Enid was 70 miles this way. Woodward was 70 miles this way. 
So everybody made their meeting. When my little brother died, if you called our farm day or night for the next 90 plus days, you talked to the dean of the college, the guy that ran Oklahoma Gas and Electric, you talked to a member of Al-Anon or AA any time, day or night. Those women cooked meals that my mom didn't need to cook. They took them places they didn't need to take them. Every nursing home within 100 miles got meals. Guys that had never seen cattle except on television were out helping my dad feed cattle. And because of his home group, he didn't drink. And when they thought it was okay, he was okay enough, they left him, but not until then. And I don't know how the Seattle area is. This is my first time here to visit, and it's incredible. I can tell you about Oklahoma City. Within 20 miles of Oklahoma City in a circle, there are 1,485 AA meetings a week. I bet there's that many or more, probably. But it's impossible to get connected, connected, bouncing meetings. Your home group are the people that love you warts and all. They know the insides and outs of you. They're the people that will come to the house when an incredible tragedy like that occurs. And here's the other thing I want to say to you. I didn't get to make that amends to my little brother, and I now know what amends are. And over the last better than a quarter of a century, I've, I've done everything I've been told to do. Sponsorship shrinks the whole deal. I don't know how you are, but when you got your ninth step assignment in your mind, here's the way it kind of came to me. Make the amends that are real handy and kind of cool. Make the amends that aren't so handy and not too cool. And then when hell freezes over. <laughs> Even if you've got some of those on that last column, I'm going to tell you this, and this is my, is my experience. If you can make an amend to a, little bre to, a, to a living, breathing person, even if it doesn't come off just like you want it to, it's a hell of a lot better than putting it in a God box or sitting at the grave chatting with the, with the person or writing letters or all of the things that, that we are advised to do and all of the things that help. But nothing helps like looking across you know, that's the same way it is with the 12-step. All of the people that don't understand us, and that's 90% of the population, they want to help us. Doctors can't help us. Preachers can't help us. One-on-one, -on -one, one drunk talking to another, or as Gary says, two liars sitting down to sort out the truth. That's what, that's what we are about. When you guys say to me, and I don't care where you live, when you say to me, Ben, I know exactly how you feel, you know exactly how I feel. Haven't you ever been in a business meeting and kind of lost your cool and somebody in the meeting went, you know, I know exactly how you feel, and you go, bullshit. <laughs> you don't have any idea how I feel. You don't know that I'm thinking about how many rounds out of an Uzi it would take to just stick you to the back wall. <laughs> and if I say things like that out loud, I don't get to work here anymore. <laughs> I'd like to tell you after that incredible catastrophe, I sobered up. That's not the case. It will surprise you, I know, but I'll tell you anyway, I did get a divorce. Then I started raising kids. I had two in the crib, and one was five. I've got two daughters and a son. I've got a redhead that lives in uh, Depot Bay, Oregon. I've got a blonde that lives in Jacksonville, and my son lives in the mountains in Colorado. Um, I 
I got 12 step because of those kids. This guy that became my sponsor came to my house and he said, Ben, you really need to give up this drinking and drugging. And I went, well, he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take this sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle. We'll put all the reasons for on one side and all the reasons against on the other. So Ben, why do you need to continue to drink and drug? And I'm not sure what I said, but I had a couple of things there. He said, okay, let's make a list of the reasons that you need to stop. And we, my little kids were looking out the front door of, the, of a big house. And uh, we, we made a list with 17 items on it, starting with the real stuff, the kids, and getting down to cars and boats and houses and stuff like that. So I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I looked at the steps on the wall, and they very distinctly said to me, due to a series of mistakes and misunderstandings and having to deal with sons of bitches like you, I drink a lot and use a copious amount of drugs. I have some relationship difficulties. I'm terribly underfinanced, and I have a complex set of social issues. And that was the foundation of my step one. So I started attending meetings. I, uh, man, you guys have some long meetings. But I found that if I would, uh, if I would knock down a couple of blues or a yellow, I could sit through about any meeting you could throw at me. But I don't know how you are, but when I take pharmaceuticals of any kind, I, I can't tell time anymore. So I would occasionally over-medicate and be in the same chair for all of the meetings. <laughs> Still be there for the 8 o'clock that night. I said, weren't you in the early bird? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was highly non-controversial, but I just wasn't getting it. I guess you guys just weren't on back then. We were making a ton of money. The oil boom was on. Uh, so we were doing outdoor concerts, and we did an outlaw concert on a ranch in northwest Oklahoma, the Waylon Jennings, the Jerry Jeff Walker, the Hank Williams Jr., and so on and so forth. And, and I was still in my program, uh, only limited to blue and yellow pills. Hank Jr. said, we're going to Sweetwater. Come on and go with us. And that ended my AA run. I'd never been to Sweetwater. Never found a reason to go back there. Had a hell of a time getting out of there. During the next few years, I made a ton of money. I made so much money that I was able to discover cocaine and live 35 years in the next three. <laughs> and when I came back to you this time, July the 15th of 1985, for what I hope is the last time. I had lost everything on the list, and in fact had lost the list. <laughs> and I still struggled with the first step. I was at this men's meeting Saturday morning at the Western Club, and some idiot had called on me, and I had vomited all over these guys in a rant. And so we were leaving, and this guy caught me. Now, this is an old black guy that had a dog. I, I got to know him later. Incredible man. But then, that's all I knew about him. He said, Ben, wait just a moment. So, I didn't know he was blind. I guess the dog should have been a tip-off, but <laughs> I was pretty much into myself, so it didn't occur to me. So as you come out of the meeting room into the big room, like the speaker room, the steps are right here on the wall. He goes, Ben, you're having a terrible first step problem. Let's take a look at the first step. So me and a blind guy and a dog are reading the first step. <laughs> he said, Ben, if you'll notice, there's a hyphen up here. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Hyphen, that our lives had become unmanageable. Hyphen in the English language means the end of one thought, the beginning of another. The thoughts aren't necessarily congruent or connected, but they can be. 
What this says to you is, Ben, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. That means, Ben, do you have problems when you drink? That our lives had become unmanageable. Ben, that says, do you have problems when you don't drink? Now, while you're thinking about that, let me tell you that if you answered yes to one of those, you're in the right place. If you answered yes to both of them, you better lighten up because your ass needs to be with us a long time. The first half of the first step is bondage to the drug. Ben, you are not really the drug addict you want to be. You're more of a pig. So to you, this says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, second all, demerol, two and all, any old thing at all. If you shoot it, huff it, snort it, take it in in any way, and it brings you back to the same place the next day, that's bondage to the drug. Ben, this is Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to the history of mankind. Out of respect, we only talk about alcohol at Alcoholics Anonymous. But for you, you do whatever you want. That is bondage to the drug. The second half, that is bondage to self. We have a page for it, Ben. It's 60, 61, 62, depending on what book you have. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we believe is our problem. Ben, you're not much, but you're all you think about. You know, it talks in the book about that moment of lucidity. And I think that's kind of when my, when my journey began, in, in, in some earnest. The second step, believe it or not, was delivered to me by my little babies. When I first got divorced, I had two in the crib. My son was less than a year old by quite a bit. My middle daughter, my redheaded daughter, was... Um, Not very much older, maybe 10 months older. I should know these birthdays, right? Um, And I was so afraid that they were going to die. And, of course, being self-obsessed, I was afraid they were going to die on my watch and I'd be blamed, right? Little babies need their mother. Now, that sounds crass, but, I mean, they really, really need their mother. And fathers really don't have a hell of a lot of business raising babies. I mean, if you think about it, the woman puts the whole thing together. I mean, the whole the whole deal. I mean, we're only responsible for a drive-by, actually. <laughs> the rest of it's pretty much taken care of over here. And then for us to start trying to raise them is, whew, it's tough. I think that's where It Takes a Village came into my life, because So many women would go, boy, this guy is a moron. We need to help here. (laughs) So I was covered up with help. But at night, they they would start to miss their mom really bad at bedtime. And they'd start that mob violence thing. One of them starts to whimper. This one takes it up an octave. This one takes it up another octave. Now we're three octaves up, and it's a shrieking. You'd swear there were 25 people in the room, and there's these two little babies. I would grab them. I'd put one a head here, a butt here, a head here, a butt here, and I'd walk them through the house, and I'd sing to them, which is probably child abuse, but that's all I had going. (laughs) And we'd have some, some rhythm, and we'd get back between the cribs, and, and I'd pull them to me, and we'd lay down between the cribs, and I'd coo and talk to them, you know, like we do. And their, their hysterics would come down, and then their breathing would come down, and their heartbeat would start to get like my heartbeat, and my heartbeat would start to slow, and, I, and, and then we'd start breathing deep, and pretty soon we'd, we'd be asleep and I'd wake up in a little while and put them in their cribs. So when my sponsor started working with me, and we came to the second step, that's what I saw over and over and over. That if somebody as generally useless to the world as a guy can take these two 
beautiful beings and comfort them to the extent that they completely give in and say, I know you got this, Dad. I know that you've got this and it's going to be okay. Then what can God do with me if I'll just lay against his chest and go, man, you, you got to get this, man. I do not have this. And that gave me the concept of God that, that I needed and that I, kept, that I keep today. And it came from my, from my kids when they were a little bitty. When we worked on the third step, my sponsor said, Ben, there's only twice that you'll ever need the third step. And I went, good, I'm good at little numbers. I'm okay with this. When's that, Johnny? He said, you'll need the third step when you're working it, like we are now, or we, when you're teaching it to someone. You'll need to know the third step. And then every day of your life. There's really nothing more to say about that. How many times have you caught yourself just in the middle of a sandstorm and gone, whew, forgot to pray about this one. God, can you please take this deal? We're about to have a train wreck here in my watch. Four and five, we lose a lot of people, and we really shouldn't. I mean, it's a very cleansing part of the steps, am I right? But we lose a lot of people there. Instead of going forward with four, they go backward in three. They take their will back. They go backward in two. They go crazy. And they go backward to one, and they drink again. We lose a lot of people there. And, and, and really shouldn't, and it's a, it's a product of sponsorship that we get those people through there, right? And then there's six and seven, and nobody talks about six and seven. How long has it been since you even thought about six and seven? I mean, if you're brand new, how many people here are in their first year of sobriety? Oh, wow. Oh. Well, I'm glad we talked a little bit about one and two. That's good. That's good. Six and seven actually are kind of, I think, easy when you're first in the program, right? Because they're right there in front of you. I mean, we've spent 15 or 20 years burning our lives completely to the ground, right? We have spent 15 or 20 years planting seeds of manure. Now we've sobered up. And the crops have come in. <laughs> fields of it. And a lot of the fields have names. IRS. <laughs> FBI. X number one. X number two. And now we're sober. We've been running from this, this stuff for 20 years. We've been drinking and drugging and not paying attention to this stuff. Now we're going to take it on. we got nothing to medicate with. Are you kidding me? And, and you see so much magic there, don't you? I mean, the magic of the... That's when we stop being takers and we start being givers in the program. But those of you that have five or six years, how long has it been since you took a hard look at six and seven? Uh, here's a little story. I heard these two guys talking. They're, they're uh, sponsors. One guy said to the other, I swear to God, he said, I got this guy. He's 35 years old on his second marriage. Got a couple of kids in each marriage. We come to, he's working the steps, did a good fifth step. Uh, so we're at six and seven. He said, I think we can go right on. So I've, I've thought about this. I've looked at it. I really don't have any shortcomings. So I think, I think we're fine here. I don't, I don't have any character defects. We'll be okay. So the other guy said, what'd you do? He said, well, I said to the guy, I'm going to give you, he said, I gave the guy 10 sheets of blank paper and some pens. I said, make 10 lines on each sheet and number one through 10. And then I want you to get coffee and cookies in your front room and invite your wife, your kids, your ex-wife, and those kids 
two college roommates, a couple of college girlfriends, a high school girlfriend, your least favorite aunt and your next door neighbor and say to them, I'm in a 12-step program and I'm supposed to identify my shortcomings and frankly, I'm having trouble identifying them. <laughs> Can you help me with this? <laughs> or there is a story that is terribly inappropriate. It's so inappropriate, in fact, that the person in the story could not have lived in Washington. I think she lived in Oklahoma. But the story goes like this. Very high society woman, old money, comes to her doctor and she says, Doctor, you've got to help me. I am passing gas. I can't stop it. I never know when it's going to happen. It happens all times... The good thing is you can't smell it and you can't hear it, but I know it's happening and it's making me so uncomfortable. Can you help me? The doctor said, yeah, I think I can. Here's a prescription. Go take these for two weeks. Come back and report in. She comes back in two weeks. The doctor says, how are we? She said, it's worse. You can smell it. He said, well, good. We fixed your nose. Now let's work on your hearing. Is that you? Are you out there and just don't want to know that we got some six and seven stuff to clean up here? This afternoon when uh, Mark was, we had a kind of an in-depth conversation and I said, uh, you know, I got to, I've got a little story tonight that I'm really struggling. I don't know that I'm going to use. And he said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll bring my mother. That should keep you from doing anything bad. So as you can see, it's worked really well. As you work the tenth step, as you are able to put your day back together, as you are observing the tenth step, which is really preventative maintenance for idiots, as you become accustomed to being in the program, you know, a guy that uh, sponsors a lot of people in our part of the country who has spoken up here, I'm not sure at this meeting, Joe L. is his name. We celebrated his 45th year the other night. He says, AA is not a bunch of meetings. It's a manner of living a way of life. And as you get into the last three steps on a daily basis, you see that that, that really, really is true. You really see in step 11 that God doesn't love you because you're good or you're trying to be good. God loves you because he's God. And occasionally in the program, more than occasionally, you get to see honest to God miracles, right? I mean, absolute miracles. This last year at the uh, General Service Conference, uh, uh, in New York, there are 93 delegates. There's not that many states, obviously. Canada has some delegates, and some states have more than one delegate. Washington has two, for instance, Eastern and Western. What is it, Area 92 and Area 72? This is 72, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at the conference, to, to, to get to know one another, every delegate gets two minutes, Everything is done on two minutes at the conference. If you had the bomb codes to Russia, you'd get two minutes to deliver them. That's the, which wouldn't be a bad idea for our area meetings, come to think of it. But two minutes, and each delegate tells you about their state. I told you about my group, the Altered Boys. We do a lot of H&I work. We're in hospitals and prisons and treatment centers a ton. 
they scatter these delegate introduction things throughout the week. And frankly, maybe they're not the most interesting thing in the world. I mean, if I'm saying, hi, I'm from Area 57, Oklahoma, 79,690 square miles, 8,800 members, eight districts. I mean, how interested are you, you know? So it's kind of a time to sort of half listen. So I was half listening. This guy came to the podium, and the room is kind of in semi-darkness, and the light shines down on the podium. And so the guy's going to do his two minutes. I don't remember what state he's from for sure, but it's up on the edge. Well, I am up on the edge, but it wasn't here. It was maybe in the middle somewhere. Anyway, he, you got two minutes, so everybody comes in firing. You're going to get your two minutes done, you know. So there's silence. So I look up there, this guy's standing there, and finally he says, how does a guy like me go from a single light shining down on him in a five by nine cell in El Reno, Oklahoma, to standing here in front of you representing my state in Alcoholics Anonymous? Now, I got to know the guy and know him well. We do H&I. El Reno is 12 miles west of Oklahoma City. We take meetings to that prison. He couldn't spell AA when he got to the penitentiary. He went there because you get one hour off with somebody else if you go to AA. He really didn't even know what AA was. And now he is a delegate representing his state in Alcoholics Anonymous, making the trip back into penitentiaries to tell guys like him, I did this. You can do this. Come along. Let me help you do this. Those are the miracles that we get to see every day. Every day. Not usually on such a for lack of a better term, grandiose scale. But every day we see people that couldn't keep it together for a 24-hour period who are leading pretty good lives. We see little Davey here who's uh, teaching school. I mean, your kid's future is in his hands type of deal. Doing good work because because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is under attack. It all, it is. That's why the traditions are so very important to us. If you don't believe Alcoholics Anonymous is under attack, there's only about 10% of us that are qualified to join it in the world. So the other 90% are going, what the hell are they doing? Think about how you thought about Alcoholics Anonymous before you got to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what they think about Alcoholics Anonymous. The inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, we are the last true democracy in the world. One person, one vote. Nobody in this room's got any more wheelbase than anybody else. You got 32 years of sobriety. You got 30 minutes of sobriety. You're a member if you say you're a member. Absolute, complete democracy. We are ruled by a group conscience. So if we don't know what's going on, we can get together and change it. That's why sponsorship is so incredibly important and why when it comes to that tradition meeting, don't be at home going, oh, tradition night. I may watch a little football here this evening. We have a book. We don't have a definition. We can't define alcoholism to you, you new people. What if the cancer people did that? Well, you got cancer. We don't have a definition for it, but sure as hell bad. It's bad. (laughs) The closest thing we have is on page 44, and if you are brand new to us, it says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. 
In the next sentence it says, if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. And on the next page it says, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. And what is your problem? Your problem is you. No matter where you went, when you got there, there you were. Still got a problem. As we welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous, we promise you that we are not a glum lot. In fact, those of you that like little trivia things, I heard this and it stuck with me. If you go to page 132 and go, how does it go? 16 lines down from the top and 16 lines up from the bottom, two words in from the left and two words in from the right, you will read the following six words. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. If you're not sure that you are an alcoholic, if you're just not sure that it fits you, then I invite you to read the book. And before you read the book, think about this for a minute. You're in an AA meeting Saturday night in the big town listening to a guy from Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm saying you got a problem. <laughs> I know this isn't show and tell, but I brought this up here to remind myself, and I'm going to close with this. I think. We're at the ballpark, aren't we? I'm going to close it with this. This is a, uh, a copy of a, uh, of a coffee table book done by Time Warner. It came out in 2000. They hired a whole bunch of really smart people at the end of the millennium to do a book of pictures and words of the, the title of the book is The 80 Days That Changed the World. So 100 years, 1900 to 2000, roughly 365 days a year for 100 years, 80 most important days. If you go to about page 13, you will find a picture of Bill Wilson and Bob Smith, Mother's Day, 1935. Alcoholics Anonymous, put together. They go ahead to call it the greatest social movement in the history of mankind. Let me ask you this. Do you treat Alcoholics Anonymous like it's that important? Have you ever had that night when you said, you know, they've got a guy from Oklahoma talking tonight. I don't think I'm going to make this one. <laughs> But you did, and I appreciate it. What's the difference between 1935 and then, uh, then and now? They didn't know if it would work. We know it works, right? We know it works. Otis died a couple of weeks ago. Otis was a uh, uh, panel 37 delegate from Oklahoma. His goal in life was to live, uh, was to be sober 50 years. He was sober 50 years and one day, and he died. I went to his funeral, and it, the funeral thing spoke like it usually does, a eulogy and all that. And then you turn to the back, and I will close with this from Otis's funeral back page. The elevator to recovery does not work. Take the steps. I love you. You can't do anything about it. Love all y'all. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.